Good afternoon, everybody in Florida. It's nice to see you all. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny morning in Spokane, Washington, and I invite you to join me in my studio, my fearless studio. So welcome. And it's going to be a lot of fun this afternoon to share with you my fearless techniques involving pouring paint and just about any other inspirational technique to make a mark. I like to use them. Well, so thank you, Ron, for inviting me. Well, I tell you what, fantastic that you're here. Been looking forward to this. Seem to track that. Well, okay, let's get started. Um, you know what I thought I'd do, uh, Elise? is um, show kind of a, a, a clip of you doing a demo. It's a, a long demo. What I did is just compacted it down to 10 minutes. And uh, I'd like to show that. And uh, I want to make sure everyone can hear it. Um, oh, I'm still, I'm still admitting these people. That, that doesn't sound right, admitting. That, well, anyway. All right, let me get that teed up for you. And there we go. And all I have to do is share my Hi, screen. My name is Elise Beatty. Welcome to my Fearless Painting Studio in Spokane, Washington. They call me the Fearless Artist, and I would like to show you how you can be fearless too. For me, being fearless starts with a pouring process that I was taught by my good friend, the talented Jean Grastorf. After learning how to pour, I then learned about incorporating acrylics and collage into my watercolor painting process. Using mixed media is easy and a fun method of taking any painting to a new level, and I am going to show you how. I invite you to take a walk with me in my yard. Let's go see what is inspiring me to paint today. I like to begin my painting process by taking my original photo and printing this reference in black and white. This monochromatic picture is now my value study from which I create a road map to drive my creative thought on. Proper preparation is my secret to a successful and fearless painting experience. So let's begin by mixing up some paint to pour. The paint I use is in a liquid form. For each color that I choose to use in my painting, I must make up a cup of fluid paint to pour three or four times during my entire process. Mixing the paint and water is an important step because I am making paint for transparent washes. I do not want unsightly lumps of paint surprising me and landing on my paper unexpectedly. I squeeze a tube of watercolors into a plastic cup filled with water. I mix vigorously until the paint is blended and then pour the liquid into a sealed ketchup bottle for later use. Now I want you to remember, shaken, not stirred. I begin the process by saturating my paper with lots of water. In my first pour, I used my liquefied Hansa Yellow, Quinacridone Red, and Thalo Blue. I move my paper to mix my paint. In my next photo, you can see how light my first transparent wash is. To build values, and keep specific areas pristine, I apply a masking agent after my wet paper is dry on those poured areas that I choose to keep. What I enjoy the most about using the incredible white mask is after applying the frisket and letting it dry thoroughly, I can apply paint in any fashion 
and not worry about overworking my saved areas where the mask is applied on my watercolor paper. Each subsequent pour or painted layer creates an added value which builds form in my composition as I work from light to dark. Halo Blue and New Gamboge Yellow are allowed to mix on the wet paper to create a beautiful dark green. Now I think I'll add a little bit of quinacridone red right along the horizon line. Lifting my paper, shifting it from vertical to horizontal and back again, aids in my creating wet into wet drip patterns on my painted surface. In this composition, I have purple irises on the lower left hand side of my painting, as well as at the center behind the fence. I will use quinacridone red, phthalo blue with lots of water to make a nice tint for my lower left hand corner. But at the center line, there's some other irises that I want to have a slightly cooler hue for. So instead of using quinacridone red, I'm pulling out my permanent alizarin crimson to make my purple tint. There are many different types of lace and or paper that can be used for this process. I have even used those wonderful holy plastic sacks that your onions and tomatoes come in. I lay them on the surface of the painting and I pour paint through them, letting them create their own fanciful patterns. By my third pour, my painting is covered with layers of masking, each layer protecting a special pattern created during the pouring process. When I have completed my pouring process, I let my watercolor paper dry overnight and then remove the masking agent. Excitement builds for the moment when the frisket is peeled off. For the first time, I get to see what my abstract techniques have produced. As you can see, I now have three distinct values in my painting. I love painting with transparent watercolor, but I discovered that when I include fluid acrylics, I am able to, one, correct light areas that have become too dark, two, create a stronger range of dark values that do not look muddy, and three, incorporate what I call fancy brushwork, which you will see shortly. Preparing my acrylic paint is as important as the mixing process for the fluid transparent watercolors. I use fluid acrylics that match the hues
Flying Giverny, inspired by my gardens and, of course, Monet. I hope you have enjoyed watching the creative process of this painting. It's been fun sharing my fearless painting techniques with you. Now that you have watched the how of my process, here are some close-up photos so that you can see the visual and textural effects created by incorporating mixed media alongside transparent watercolors. Following is a gallery of paintings from my portfolio. Over the years, I have used these methods to create art that is both representational and abstract. Now that is a piece of cake. You just... Uh... It's a little different than my painting process. Uh, we already have some questions. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Uh, first one is, what was the adhesive you were using? I use Golden's Heavy Gel Matte Media. And I find this works just fine. I can thin it down if I need it, or I can put it on thickly if I'm using a heavier paper. And then I weight down whatever, if it's a heavy paper, oh, just using whatever is convenient to hold it down until the 100% adhesive properties have dried. Ah, cool. All right. Uh, any other questions? Be uh, Jump right in there and put those in place. Oh, sorry. I got the video going in. There it is. Okay. Uh, I need a little music there anyway. Uh, okay. Some other questions we've got. Uh, one, um, tell me a little bit about the brush you're using to uh, put on the frisket. To put on the frisket, I because frisket is uh, so problematic with the, uh, shall we call it, health of a brush, and because brushes are so ex expensive, I find the cheapest brushes that I can find that still maintain a good point. My favorite is Cheap Joe's Starving Artist Brush because it's affordable, but I can still do a lot of detail with the painting of the frisket. Oh. And I use them in sizes anywhere from a 6 to a 10. So when they give up, you throw them out then. That's it. I, first of all, I wash them in soapy water before I dip into the frisket and then wash them out at, uh, right after that. Hey, what um, acrylics do you use there? There at the end, you were using some acrylics. What were those? Golden acrylics. Golden fluid acrylics are my favorite. What? Say that again. Golden fluid acrylics. Oh. Huh. So by golden. Yes. Uh, now, what were, describe some of those fancy uh, textures and papers you were using there. Well, the different papers uh, range from uh, a vast array of oriental lace papers that have the patterns made uh, into it, the squares, the half moons, or the circular shapes, which is one of my favorites. That's my, I call it my Van Gogh favorite paper because of the swirls in it. I love the type of pattern that it leaves behind. Plus, it's a wonderful paper to adhere to the surface for my textural effects. Um, I also, I will use just about anything. I, I enjoy breaking the rules when it comes to transparent watercolors. Yeah. Uh, now, is that where the word fearless comes from? Uh, about 25 years ago, I had students in a watercolor class. And when they uh, first discovered my pouring techniques, that was the name that they gave me. And it stuck with me all, the, all along. And now all my classes are titled Fearless Painting. I just got done teaching and advanced inspirational techniques for fearless uh, painting here in Spokane that involved the pouring of the watercolors, uh, different other techniques like Sumi Nagashi, and of course, collage. Oh, that's cool. I, before I forget, I, could, I can imagine, you're, I know you teach classes. Do you have students who bring in all their uh, 
any samples of textures they run onto. I could just picture, hey, I, I got a new one for you. It's all about sharing. And that's the most <laughs> wonderful thing about that, this, especially this last workshop, because we were exploring and experimenting together. Ah, that's cool. Hey, uh, what's, uh, what substrate do you use uh, primarily? I know it's Canvas. What's some other substrate you use? Oh, well, that's a very interesting question, because I will pour on anything from 140 pound, my Favorite, of course, is 300 pound watercolor paper. And then I've done it on uh, canvases. I've done it, I like linen canvas or cotton canvas. I've poured on wood. Uh, you can paint on just about any surface and a lot of it has to do with the preparation process that I use <laughs> in my painting. That's cool. Hey, how about if um, I've got some of your paintings teed up in the titles on them. Uh, would you mind if we just got, kind of go through a couple of them and you could describe how you did it and give us a little commentary? And, of course. Uh, and people could ask questions, you know, that are specific to that. Okay, let me pull it up. And is, okay, I'm, I'm getting there. Now, hold on. Come on, everybody be patient. All right. <laughs> okay, I got to be sure. All right, all I have to do now is share my screen. And all right, uh, let's see. Can there we go? Can everybody see that? I guess they can. All right, tell us a little about it. There's the um, title, and, um, and also I put this as number one for the for the reason for the win. So there's a lot to talk about in this painting. I really enjoy working with abstraction. Uh, I approach the abstracted paintings in the same way any of my representational in that I'm still pouring. I'm doing three or four different pours throughout the painting process. This painting is, uh, was created on canvas. And of course, I started out with the idea of capturing where I live and what I do. But it wasn't until I'd been painting this canvas for about two months and I just wasn't quite satisfied. And then in the middle of the night, it came to me that I should put me into the painting. So in the upper right-hand corner is a window of yellow. And I just said, well, what if I'm looking out on my universe? So I did a very gestural and abstracted self-portrait and therefore the title of the painting, Window on My Universe. Hmm. Now, this is poured watercolor and acrylics. I did not do any collage in this particular painting. Are there uh, no acrylics on here? It's all watercolor? It's poured watercolors and the fluid acrylics. Okay. Now, can you use uh, just regular acrylics or do you need to use or recommend fluid acrylics? Absolutely. Any of the acrylics will work. I like the fluid because I'm working with such a wet watercolor, so they balance each other out. The one most important thing is to match the colors of your acrylics to uh, the colors that you're using in the watercolors. So hmm. Hansa Yellow is Hansa Yellow in my acrylics, but uh, New Gamboge Yellow the closest that I found in the fluid acrylics would be Daralide yellow. So I balance each to resemble the original hue that I poured with. That's cool. And uh, uh, the uh, Women Artists Association is uh, that's a pretty big deal. Everybody, most people are aware of it. So uh, you won a innovative abstract. That's uh, quite cool. It was a wonderful honor. I'm very grateful. Hmm. All right, let's move to the next one. There we go. Uh, oh, this one I really like. This is a new painting I did uh, this spring. And last year when I was recuperating from surgery, I spent a lot of time on my deck watching my hummingbird. So I started taking pictures of it. When you have nothing else to do, you might as well be creative, at least in, <laughs> with a camera. And uh, this painting is... Um, derived from those photos of watching the hummingbirds come and land. And then I decided, no, I want to go back to my whimsical self. So mm. I decided, well, what are these birds doing? Well, they're at a cafe. And then, of course, I wasn't quite happy with the composition. So I decided to put the open sign behind the bird to balance the large size of the hummingbird, <laughs> uh, the restaurant, and uh, being open for service. Oh, that's, that's cool. 
Uh, now, on the um, textures and the, you know, the collage material, do you ever leave some of that on the paintings? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, sometimes I leave the papers. In this particular instance, when I, for example, the little flowers in the background, I uh, borrowed a technique from Kathleen Conover in using what she calls gesso juice, which is one third <laughs> mixture of water one third medium and one third gesso. And it still gives a wonderful matte effect, but it lets me, for example, the flowers in the background here, the little white flowers, can you, layer uh, can it you, in. Can you uh, tell us that mixture again? What was that mixture? Gesso juice is made from one third gesso, one third uh, water and one third medium. And I mix it into a bottle. This is just a honey bottle and I shake it up and it lasts for quite a while. And it's a wonderful way of going in and uh, creating new lights onto my painting without using the shininess of a acrylic. Oh, that's, that's, that's cool. Now uh, let's move to the next one. There we go. I love classic cars. I enjoy going to all the different vintage car shows, meet them and wherever they are on television and the variety of exhibitions. And this was a 1952 caddy that I had seen and decided, oh, I just have to paint the reflection. So I uh, set this up. I decided to crop the image to what I thought was the important area, the, the hmm. lights and the bumper, the reflection. And I poured it. And then I used a uh, very little bit of acrylics in this, but mostly just to bring out the lights and everything else is transparent watercolor. Hmm, cool. Well, this kind of brings up um, because of reds and greens in there. Uh, someone asked, uh, how do you keep uh, and avoid mud? You're turning the colors turning into mud. You mean when I'm pouring? That's a good question. Um, one is I start with one color, I let the areas mix throughout wherever I want to, then I pour it off into a container. Uh, and then I go in and I start adding the, the, for example, the blues and yellows that might be added. A lot of what you see in the separation is going in after the looseness of the wet media with the acrylics and further bringing out the hues in terms of local color that I see based hmm. upon my photo. Good, thank you. That was from um, Bonetta, I believe. Uh, tell us a little bit about the road to better days. Now, when I first saw this, um, I didn't think of roads, but as soon as that <laughs> title pops in your brain, you see nothing but roads. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I did this at the beginning of the pandemic and I wanted uh, to create a subject matter that would lead to positive thought and here go the road. Uh, it's also poured watercolors. It was done on a 10 by 10 canvas. I used the acrylics to create the pointillistic and the line patterns. And that's something I do in a lot of my paintings. I, I like to include a lot of pattern of busyness in my imagery. And uh, you always uh, start off with a drawing. Uh, do you ever just like throw it on there or? I mean, I don't mean to make it sound that simple, but that's what I'd probably do. <laughs> Even in my abstract paintings, I start with a, a line drawing. I call this my roadmap. I don't want to get lost. So I have to have a starting point, a midpoint, and a finishing. And I just travel along this road, adding uh, paint, subject matter, whatever it is to create the story that I'm looking to paint and write within my composition. Cool. Now, uh, any of you have any questions, don't be afraid to write them or turn on your mic and ask it. Um, either way is appropriate. Here's another painting right here. I found uh, because of the texture. Uh, can you just uh, tell us a little more about that texture in the back? Well, texture everywhere, but that I think there's some uniqueness on that. How did you get those yellowish? Well, tell us. 
Well, you remember all the pouring that I do and you saw how some of these papers are laid onto the surface to create patterns underneath it? Well, I don't throw any of that away. I save those little pieces of paper because they're absolutely wonderful to collage to create the textural effects such as the swirls in the clouds, the squares on the mountain in the background, the patterns in the tree. And then after I've poured and I've used some acrylics and then I've done a little bit of uh, collage work, then I go back and I, I can use more watercolors or acrylics, allowing them to play with each other on the surface of the painting. So it's a constant process of give and take of working with all the mediums, layering them, letting them dry to create their own physiological effect, and then making choices from there. Hmm. Um, someone asked, how do you get the uh, squares? It's, uh in there, uh, I guess, is that from the material or patterns or? That's because I, I control the shapes by using the frisket. So uh, as I'm building up, I'm deciding what uh, patterns or geometric forms or shapes in terms of, for example, trees uh, I want to use in a composition and I block areas off. And some of the areas are quite large or have a specific shape. Oh, that's cool. Someone asked uh, about the composition. How do you, how do you, uh, it says, what are your composition considerations in abstract painting? In other words, uh, how do you compose an abstract? How do you go about that? Well, I'm basically looking at the same principles that I do in terms of uh, any sort of representational work. I want a balance. I want something in the foreground, in the midground, in the background. Um, one of my favorite compositional effects utilizes the golden means where I divide the space uh, a rectangle into a square, another rectangle, and so on and so forth uh, to create the imagery itself. And a lot of the painting composition occurs as I paint it. I let the painting make certain decisions on its own and I follow its directions. Yeah, cool. Well, uh, back to the uh, river uh, walk. Uh, Janet asked the question in the river walk, does the lace and other things stay in the painting? Are they there, left there? Well, this one I poured and then I removed the lace papers or whatever I was using. If I'm using a plastic sack or whatever type of imagery. And once that's done and dried and I've used the acrylics, then I save these little pieces of paper. I'm only collaging with the lace papers or Japanese masa paper. And I glue that back down onto the surface of the paper or the canvas that I'm using. Hmm. All right. So, yes, it stays on the surface. It's permanent. Cool. See, uh, this one here, here we go. Uh, this is very unique. It's a recent, very recent one, I think. This is my hand. This is what I look like after fearless painting. Now, hold your hand up. I'm going to, no, it, you have to do <laughs> Let's see. It would be something like this. <laughs> so you don't wear rubber gloves or anything like that? Oh, I should. I try to some of the times, especially when I'm doing the collage or the acrylics. Yeah. And then what's unique about this painting is not only was I pouring the watercolors, I was also using the acrylics and I was also collaging paper on top of it. But you know those skins that you find left over on your acrylic palette? If you're very careful and you get a palette knife underneath them, you can lift them up in little shapes. And I literally collaged these skins of acrylic onto this painting. So that's real paint on this painting. <laughs> I'm just, uh, it's just like a, um, a painting you want to study all day, all the uh, textures and then like all watercolor paintings, you finally move back 15 feet and it just is a beautiful composition. Oh, thank you. Okay, here's, oh, there's, uh, that's the one of you. It's not a very good, uh, some reason, picture. Uh, but that's you painting. Yes, it is. I call it caught in the act. I think the next painting should be a, you, a picture of you painting, you painting. That would be cool. Oh, that could be interesting. I and may then have inside, to... The next one would be one inside that. So, uh, but anyway. <laughs> hmm. I'll have to think oh. about perhaps Erte. I'll follow <laughs> his leads. Oh, my. This is cool. 
These are my a- two cats. Yeah. Having a and- discussion about life. <laughs> now, obviously, they're not blue and orange, but my guess is they're cool and warm colors, right? Um, well, I, I try to step away from the reality of local colors <laughs> and <laughs> use my imagination. Although Onyx, the cat in the foreground, she is a beautiful black cat. But why limit to just black when I can make so many different colors out of the dark shape? <laughs> you made a comment I like. I'm going to jump on is you sometimes like to stay away from reality. Yeah. <laughs> That's Sometimes cool. that's helpful to painting. That's cool. I think that's um, that's a great concept to think about. Is you? I think we do. Uh, maybe get too wrapped up in uh, literal, uh, and just don't step back and think of uh, moving out of this reality. I don't know what reality you move into, but uh, that's another think, topic. Think of it a little bit like I don't want to be a slave to my photo. Uh, I want to uh, use my imagination. Okay. Uh, Janet asked, uh, do you use pen and ink to outline some of your figures? I have, yes. Um, I will use your, um, if it's a thin line I'm looking for, I like the micron pens, the Pigma micron pens. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of the times I will outline just with a, a, I use a, Uh, the Prado brushes from Escoda. And I find that they are such a high quality of brush that with a gentle touch, I can get as fine a line as I want uh, to outline anything that I'm dealing with. Yeah. uh, uh, On this uh, painting, uh, I find interesting are the values. And um, it looks like, you know, you follow, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but that line, uh, I, I think you took a lot of non-reality um, privileges on this, uh, even though it's probably pretty close to the historical district. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that approach of seeing uh, the values and interpretation as you go? I think values are probably the most important thing in any of my paintings. If I know where the lights and darks and the in-between values are, I can create the volume or the three-dimensional atmospheric perspective that I'm looking for. So even when I start from a photo, in this case, this was a uh, the a old, old 17th century mill in Bridgewater, Connecticut that I used to drive by when I lived there as a teenager. And I've had this photo for many, many years, always wanted to paint it. And so I still want to be painterly. I'm not looking to be uh, photorealistic like Richard Estes. I'm looking to be uh, looser and incorporate more brushwork and pattern in the pieces that I do. Mm. And what's also important in any painting isn't just always what you put in, but what you leave out. Love it. All right. We got another one here. Um, you do a lot of uh, florals and um, you do landscapes, florals. What's the other topics that you abstracts, uh, (coughs) whatever hits my imagination. This is, I just finished this painting a couple of weeks ago. I have a beautiful dendrobium orchid that's bloomed uh, every year for about five years now. And I decided that in this painting, I want to see if I can paint, dare I say it, like normal people uh, and just (laughs) use transparent watercolor. And I didn't pour this one. I used a brush. (laughs) Well, after getting to know you, I I definitely wouldn't call you normal uh, (laughs) in in a good way. Uh, This, this painting um, um, is uh, all painting. There's no, uh, it's not poured, right? No, this was uh, just traditional transparent watercolor techniques. I think the most unusual thing about this is I'd always taken photos straight on. I'd never considered taking one from the top looking down. So this was a compositional challenge for me. Yeah, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way. I didn't. So that's looking down into the vase. Yes. Well, you sure like to make things hard. I mean, make things interesting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, here's another cool one. Don't be afraid to ask questions. The more questions you ask, the more credit you get. And we have frequent fire points with uh, Contab. 
Uh, so far, Helen has 7,000 points for her frequent fire program. Uh, so this is called Morning Reflections. Yes. Uh, so this, this is, is uh, go ahead. This is a poured painting and uh, traditional use of uh, frisket to divide uh, the, and save the lights that you see in the background. Um, it, it's also, I used a little bit of acrylics, mostly my um, gesso and my gesso juice. Uh, one of the techniques I'm also using is mixing the gesso juice, but then instead of using acrylic paints, I mix up a slurry of watercolor and I mix it into my gesso juice when I'm layering the paint. So well, it creates almost like a, a gouache type paint and opaque watercolor. Yeah, I, I have to hand it to you. You definitely know how to use gesso juice. <laughs> That's really cool. Oh, there's another one. Um, now, you can see how varied uh, your paintings are. And I think um, you can talk to this. Uh, the variability is because you use so many different textures and different techniques. Um, I was watching the uh, kind of the demo and just observing, uh, like even when you put on the uh, frisket, uh, you're not always just brushing it. Sometimes you splatter it and sometimes you almost throw it. And, um, uh, and here's an example where I think you may have done a little throwing. Oh, uh, I did this painting in class. We did uh, a variety of different ways of decorating our papers from pouring paint, uh, dribbling, you name it, I'll do it all. I even put my frisket into bottles and I'll extrude it in thin lines too, where needed. Uh, this is watercolors, acrylics and collage. And then afterwards I decide, well, I want to put something in the upper right corner to improve the composition. Mm -hmm. So oh, enter hummingbird. <laughs> Once again. That's uh, just, just lovely. Uh, we have a question uh, Judy wants to know. So what are you planning to do next? Mm. Well, I've just finished the last of the orchid paintings and I'm seriously thinking I was in... Uh, on vacation in April and had the pleasure of going to Natchez, Mississippi and the beautiful antebellum uh, mansions and the gardens. So I'm thinking of my next painting being involving one of the, an architectural rendering of one of those incredible uh, houses. Your, inter your answers are very interesting. Um, I never would have guessed that, but- uh... I love variety. Yeah, well, you, you uh, looks like you spent a lot of time observing. What's your connection with Kentucky? You used to live there? Or? Yes, my husband and I lived there. He's a U.S. Coast Guard licensed master and was working search and rescue on the lakes in the area. We spent eight years living there in uh, uh, the town of Paducah, Kentucky. Huh, that's cool. All right, let's go. Uh, I think we've got one more. Let's see. Oh, there it is. The Hidden Tiger. I like the word, uh, definitely the way it is hidden with all of the shapes. And um, uh, I have to admit, this painting should be nominated for the most um, assorted shapes. <laughs> Winner of the most assorted shapes. Tell us a little bit about this, what went into it. And this is a, a, a painting, not any pouring or texture? No, I actually poured on this one. Oh. Um, this, is, this is Romeo, one of my cats. And he was sitting on a branch of a weeping cherry tree that I have in my yard that is just absolutely incredible. And it has these hanging blossoms that come down with the leaves because it's a weeping tree. And of course, uh, being a cat and, and uh, hiding amongst, he was trying, you know, wearing his invisibility cloak. And yet I was still able to capture him with, I love my cell phone because I can take pictures when no one's looking. And uh, oh, I did that painting really from him. Cool. Very cool. I like it. Uh, the uh, colors are, um, trying to think how to describe those, that they're very uh, muted. Uh, a lot of them are, look like you're mixed a little bit with compliments. And thus it gives you a little bit of a, I'm trying to think, it gives you a little bit of a, a mood when you see this. Uh, what mood were you after? A good mood or a weird mood? What was the? 
It definitely oh, is a moody one. He, he's a little moody. So I had to capture his personality. Uh, the, and that's why I chose to use the complementary colors of the reds and the greens and uh, just to sort of make the content of the painting match his intrigue. He's hunting and who knows what he's hunting for. Oh, I like that. You know, I want everyone to know that um, Sunday afternoon, us all together is fun and that uh, we can relax and uh, enjoy ourselves. Uh, so now let's just you and I, without your paintings, um, Let's, uh, let's get a couple more questions. Does anybody else have a question? Because I've got at least seven or eight, but I don't like to ask all the questions because sometimes my questions are hard. Anybody? I know there was one question about how I prepare my substrata. And uh, to answer yeah. that question, um, I like to gesso my paper. I make a light slurry of a mixture of water and gesso, just straight water and gesso. And I coat my paper prior to doing my roadmap of a drawing. And then on my canvas, I use something called absorbent ground, watercolor uh, medium, which allows me to also buy golden. Daniel Smith makes another product similar to this. And that allows me to use my frisket and my watercolor techniques on different surfaces, such as the wood or the canvas. Wow. Uh, that was a lot. Let's back up. <laughs> you use the, uh, that's a ground, uh, what kind of material is that? I've it's seen called it. absorbent ground. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, is that uh, technically kitty litter? <laughs> It's the same type of um, product that would be used on the Frederick watercolor canvases. Yeah. But instead of buying a processed canvas, I like to use my own canvases. I will frequently stretch linen and then use this on top of it. And it allows me to do the techniques that I want. As far as watercolor paper, I'm just using a straight mixture of, oh, it's probably maybe 20% gesso to 80% water, very, very thin. And I just coat it with a wide two or three inch brush and let it dry and then do my drawing. And it's a good idea to do it front and back, especially if you're using a 300 pound watercolor paper to avoid the curve that happens. Yeah, as the paper that's dries. A, a good point. I really um, enjoy, uh, again, is the fascination and variety that you have all that coming from one brain is uh, and heart, of course, uh, I think is pretty inspiring. Uh, I have another question for you. Um, how do you keep um, all your stuff organized, especially do you uh, categorize every texture and lace paper and paper uh, cloth or how do you do that? Well, the lace papers I use, I keep in Ziploc bags. So once I've used it and it's colorful, then I put it, I have a yellow and orange and red. So I'm, it's very easy for me to go and grab the colored papers that I'm using. The, when it's a virgin white lace paper, it just comes in sheets, generally about 19 by uh, 27 inches. And I can cut either with scissors to get a sharp edge, I could tear to get a very loose abstract edge, or I will use a brush dipped in water with the brush creating a line or a shape and then softly tearing the paper along the wet line. And I save all these things in the bags. <laughs> I was kind of visualizing, I hadn't seen uh, your background in your studios. I was visualizing something a little different as far as the studio it's actually quite neat, uh, at least from this vantage point. I was expecting something else. <clears throat> Just don't look at my drafting table. I oh, understand well. that should be signed and, and sold as a work of art. As many <laughs> layers of paint as are on it. Uh, <laughs> I noticed um, you got a lot of uh, wetness that goes to the edge of the paper. Um, how do you keep that from blossoming and going back into the uh, paper? That's a very good question. Thank uh, you. Most, 
Most of the time I pour into just a standard Rubbermaid type container, a large one that gives me a little bit of depth. I also have large concrete uh, mixing bins that I could use, which are even for the 22 by 30 sheets. I will take my paper and I will place it on top of, oh, half a dozen cups, just plastic cups. So it's elevated a little bit. So the paper sits on the surface, uh, the bins down here, the cup, and then the paper. And that way the water falls off the edges. So it okay. doesn't uh, okay. create those blooms that you're talking about. The other thing is I'm using a hairdryer to paint with. I push with the high uh, energy of a hot hairdryer, I push that paint off into the edge and I allow some of the blooms to occur when they uh, automatically are created in shapes that win my approval. Yeah. Shapes you want. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, when um, now you do sketch out um, rough sketch, I think I saw one that where you, you, is that a norm? You always sketch out what you're going to paint? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Even in my uh, abstracts, I'll design an abstract in Photoshop, just creating shapes and then distorting them with the different programs. And then I'll print that idea out and then I will um, reproduce the shapes. Uh, sometimes I'll just start drafting lines across uh, looking for a cruciform or a different type of compositional effect. And then I start going in with the frisket further developing some medium-sized shapes inside of the larger shapes and then the smaller shapes inside of the medium-sized shapes. Huh. Oh, well, that makes sense. Now, uh, I'm thinking about your process. Do you ever stop, let it dry, uh, other than when you're taking the frisket off? Do you ever stop more often and just let it dry and paint over it? Or it seems like you really go after it and um, do a lot. Uh, before it's dry. All my paintings are, I, I have to put 90% thought into it. I have to stop and look at it. I'll frequently turn it upside down and let it sit in the living room for a while <laughs> until I figure out what it is the next step that I want to say or do to the particular painting. And when that question is answered, whatever it might be, for example, in window on my universe, it was all this, these planets and this energy and these patterns, but it wasn't until I put the little person in the upper right corner that I think tied the whole subject matter together. So yes, that took, Oh, about two months of thought before I came up with that idea. Okay. Well, that's kind of the question I had is the, you ever do that and uh, wow. that's that's pretty cool so you're always thinking how uh, what do you do with your paintings I have a website, which uh, is an e-commerce site. So you can purchase paintings right off my website. Mm -hmm. I uh, exhibit at different uh, venues here in Spokane and around the country. And of course, enter exhibitions whenever the uh, opportunity presents itself. Oh, that's cool. And um, uh, you teach, uh, you teach classes, don't you? Tell us a little bit about your classes. Didn't, do you ever do any Zoom classes where we could Absolutely. I teach, uh, I'm an adjunct instructor for the Spokane Community College. Uh, during the summertime, my classes are in person, but in the wintertime, uh, starting in October, those classes will be uh, online. And then I also uh, teach for the Wacom Community College on the west side of the state. And all of those classes and the North Seattle classes are all online. Oh. And we do watercolors and acrylics, and I have beginners, intermediates, and advanced classes that I do online. How, uh, if we were interested in, how do you, how do you sign up? Where's the information? Is it on your website or? Yes, it is. There's okay. a page dedicated to art, my art classes and my workshops. Yeah, tell us that website again. I, I'll start at www. Beattyartworks.com. Okay, your so last name. B e a t t i e. A R T W O R K S dot com. Good. Thank you. We'll get oh, the word out. And thank maybe you. some people uh, want to come paint with me. Yeah. Now we're running out of time. Um, uh, can you just tell us one thing? I forgot to ask you uh, a little bit how got, you got into painting and uh, do you have an art degree or what, what's your background? 
I uh, grew up in New York City. I started my first class was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art when I was about five years old. I've been studying art and painting ever since then. And I went to Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. Yep. It was my initial studies, but I've never stopped studying. I've had the pleasure of learning from some of the greatest artists, including Jean Grasdorf and Chen Ki Chi and oh. Milford Zorns. And those are the people who have inspired me and, and keep me asking questions. Oh, well, I, I think uh, you just said the key is, is never stop. And you started when you were young. And by the way, the uh, New York Museum of Art is just uh, still one of the most fascinating places to stop and see. Uh, anyway, I've got a few things I want to uh, uh, talk about. Um, and Randy uh, said, thanks, um, Elsie, you're definitely fearless. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Yeah. And uh, speaking of Randy, I want to just share real quick uh, what we have coming up. See, what did I do with everything? Let me share my screen. Any closing uh, comments you'd like to make, Elsie? Um, what can I say? Carpe paintum. You can say bye. You. Carpe paintum. Seize the paint and have fun. That's the most <laughs> important thing. And uh, that's all I can say. Enjoy it. Every, yeah. every painting should be an adventure and just dive in and play. Yeah. And you know what? Every time I've talked to you, uh, there's been quite a few times over the last few years. And um, every time I have done, it's like I feel good and I just am motivated to do something. And, uh, and usually motivated to try something different. But it's just, you make me feel good. I think everyone would say oh. that about you when they're around you. Ron, thank you. I appreciate your compliment.